All right. If you have questions, I think we have somebody with a microphone and we open up the discussion. Uh, I want to sit here, yeah. Um, so, um, Alison, how is it different if you do design with your team in Japan and uh, to, let's say, maybe American-centric or even European point of view? Because in Japan, they had all the, let's say, uh, very gimmicky software, um, the, the, let's say, services which were before iPhone, which was in some ways even more advanced. And some people really stick still to their clap, uh, clap shell clamshell um, uh, factors, so it's very challenging to design for this, no? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, you always have to take into consideration the different cultures, their technology landscapes. So when we're designing a global ecosystem, maybe for someone like Nissan or Volkswagen, you start off with that base set of functionality and that base sort of set of personas and customer needs, but then you have to be able to flex it. You can't force a solution onto a market just because it's easy. Just because something's going to work in the UK doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in a different market. So, for example, something like NTC exists across Android, iOS, Win8, all of the different devices, and we will flex that to work in, in all of the different markets necessary. So we'll look at the clamshell phones and we'll look at the penetration of those different devices and make sure that it works for that marketplace. But yeah, it does add a lot of complexity, a lot of challenge, and sometimes an awful lot of time to your project that you might not necessarily want. All right. Um, what's your experience with going multicultural? Um, is there something different or is it more US-centric design coming over to Europe or how does the... Uh... No, I, I think especially for, especially for Asia there's huge differences in China uh, and obviously also in emerging markets in terms of both devices, network speeds and all kinds of things. So yes, you need to have user, user, folk, or user testing in each one of those markets to get the feedback from, uh, from the individual users. And uh, yeah, like China, for example, they, like, people love things that are more flashy, colorful, emoticons, happiness, and, uh, and which also means that a lot of the time you actually have to localize it. So you can create something that maybe is 80% the same, and then you make, add that 20%. So if you look at Evernote as a good example of this, they've launched a completely different service in China. And it's been ex very successful thanks to that. So yeah. I think that's a, it's a good example of... So you started 2005-ish, 2006, yeah. and um, I mean, in that time we had like still almost, I mean, we had Java phones, so fragmentation was a big, big problem. All of a sudden, you know, everything was zoomed into the iPhone and there was a business, Android came along, and now we're back to fragmentation with Android, right? Is that getting more complex? And uh, I want to hear from all of you, because if it's, let's say, we have 5 billion connected devices and 50 billion device, uh, let's say phones, and then devices coming in a you know, more sensors and stuff. Um, how to keep up with, let's say, fragmentation? Is that a big problem or challenge? Yeah, it is definitely a huge challenge. I think everybody wished a couple of years ago that HTML5 would be that answer and that suddenly it would just all work. And then uh, Mark Zuckerberg came out and said, actually, it doesn't work. No. And then everybody else followed that. And now, so now we're a little bit, I wouldn't say back to square one, because I think there are solutions, so responsive design is obviously one, that it, uh, but it's still a compromise, uh, which means that if we want to get a great, great experience for each device, we have to think about how you develop that for each device. But I think the, the, the starting point should always be anyway, is, is who are the, like, what's the user, what do they need in each situation, and then try to adapt that to the individual devices. How do you deal with fragmentation? Same point of view, effectively. I mean, it is horribly complex, more complex than we would like, really. And I think it's uh, the same thing. You need to start with the user. There are lots of ways that you can get around it. So, yeah, responsive, people like Accelerator who can create one code base and push it across all platforms. But actually, you've got to think about it from a customer point of view. And if I've got an Android phone and I'm downloading a native app onto that, there is an expectation that that will work in the way an Android phone will, will work. Similarly, iOS, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of people at the moment who think I can create it once and just push it out across all of those devices, but you can't, because if you're doing that, you're actually being disloyal or dishonest to the consumers that are using those platforms. So I think you always have to start off by understanding where's your core user base? Is it on iOS? Is it on Android? Do you start with one platform and then slowly roll out across the others? The approach we normally take is to start with one test and learn on that one device, and then start rolling out to a broader platform set. 
So Lars, how do you deal with fragmentation? And I think if you go into, let's say, the Internet of Things, um, and you're much more dealing with uh, products, if you say, and there's only one blinking, you know, little LED light, which is sort of where you can put. The, it's not that sexy, you say, if you compare it to iPad and all these things, which you can do with a big screen, right? So, what? Uh, how do you deal with all these different things? Oh, there's like two or three questions in yes. one. No, I always try that. <laughs> <laughs> no, on one, on one hand, I wish we had that problem of that fragmentation. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're like one step behind, or, or, or three, four steps behind. There is. Um, there, there's like a complete separation. So like any, any device is only talking to one thing and then maybe in the back end there's a way of opening up. So what we actually really need is, is some way to create that, that, that internet of things that I was talking yeah. about earlier, some meaningful way for people to actually, you know, giving some, uh, some incentive to actually open up and say, you know, like, you know, we, we can, you know, sell our data or we can, we can make things available there and you, you can then le leverage this information and build new services on it. So, so what, once that is happening, I think then we can, or then we have to deal with the fragmentation yeah. because the, um, the objects, they will be much more different in the way how they express. So, I mean, you know, this, this table is a pretty dumb thing and it's maybe really good to use it. But like another example would be, you know, an office chair. An office chair, you can sit down and it can tell, maybe help you with your posture and how you sit there. And, but the way how it expresses itself, um, be it through vibration, be it through redirecting yourself, there's like a much greater variety of how objects can express themselves. Right. And of course, there the, the trick is that we, 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 we choose an expression or a self-expression of objects that is, that is natural, that feels natural, so that people know from how they normally use an object, it's not that they don't have to rethink how they really use it, but it, they're just building on, on the existing use. But again, uh, there will be like a huge variety of, of ways how objects are, you know, express themselves you or said, how you interact with you them. You said something, so let's say, um, how do you express something normal in a normal way or so? So uh, here's this like uh, Nokia shiny uh, Windows thing. Mm -hmm. And I just saw yesterday that um, you can, I don't know, you can save something. Mm -hmm. And what's the symbol for save? Well, it's a diskette. Thing. Like it's from the 80s, so they want their phone back. Uh, so they get, make a call. So what is um, and and in, in the um, let's say in the iOS system it says just save because I don't find an icon for it. But if we want to, so what is and you what is this word um, whether we follow sort of the natural path and uh, there's a word for that um, skimmorphic. Yes, exactly. What is it? Skimmorphic. Okay, can you explain? Does anybody know what that is? Okay, so let's explain what the difference is between <laughs> that. Ouch. Um, so skewmorphic is around sort of trying to follow real-world design. So when you look at iOS, iOS is what we call flat design, um, and you've taken away any sort of gradients, curves, anything that gives it a real-world feeling. Leather, Ske stitching, exactly. all these Exactly. Whereas yeah. skewmorphic is, if you were to look at the old version of iOS, the iBooks, it was a bookcase. It had a wood tone to it. It felt like a bookcase. So skewmorphic is much more about feeling like you're actually manipulating a real world. So if there was a table in a phone, it would look like a table, whereas in a flat design, we clear all of that out, and it's all about the pure design elements. So how, where do you tend to, what is easier for you as a designer? Is it, have we reached a point where, let's say, okay, in the first couple of, let's say last decade, we had to train people, well, it's actually easy, it's okay, it looks like the real world, you know it from you know, leather stitching, and now we moved on because it's just our everyday object? Flat design is much harder to hide the mistakes. So as a designer, if you're designing for iOS or you're designing flat design, you can't, there are no excuses effectively. You can't avoid anything that's a little bit unclear or a little bit difficult to use. And I think people have seen that a lot in iOS. It looks amazing, it looks great, but there's actually things in it that don't quite work. From a consumer point of view, I think people are still very comfortable with more that sort of more natural skeuomorphic design. Um, everyone's coming around to flat, but I don't think we're there yet. So, um, do you have a point of view on that? I think, I think in, in the physical world, I mean, the, the, the skeuomorphic should be kind of built in. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, yeah. you take the Nest thermostat, and what you do is you turn that thing in the same way you, you, you're, you're turning the home thermostat, yeah. and it's kind of natural. So, I mean, yes, we could have built something that is, is, is a flat screen like this one, and I say, you mm. know, up the temperature or lower the temperature. Um, but, but then we would, actually, would be just losing out. So if you can just like leverage what a product is already offering us, right. then, then the more natural people are going to use it. 
So you, everyone, see, yeah. you see that a lot in in-car design. So everyone in in-car is moving towards flat touch screen. And actually, when you're looking at that context of use, just having a solid button that you can press or a dial that you can turn is a much simpler interface element. So there's got to be that balance of going towards a more digital flat experience compared to something that's simple and easy and the right thing to do. Right. Yeah, but I think this is also has also a lot to do with um, I mean, when you're driving, you should look at the road. Hopefully. And, uh, and, and touch, touch screens are just like a big challenge in the car mm. context because you have to always look. Right. So having somewhere, yes, you can have those interactive experiences, but um, if you can do something more haptic, so you have one channel, one yeah. um, um, cognitive channel on the road, but the other one can still deal with other things. Right. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and uh, somebody with a microphone, I think, is approaching you. And uh, I have one last question before we have this. So um, if, if you, we're talking about car design. So I think there's only cash registers are more uglier than in-car design panels. I mean, you look at and even some of the big German brands, it's like, oh, wow, we have something new. And it's so like, I don't know, very ugly. When do we get something really nice and uh, in there? They have like, these seven years innovation cycles. So they're like, I don't know, six and a half years behind or something. Actually, one nice, it already exists, actually. So compare, I think, in Hall 3 at Mobile World Congress, there are something like nine or ten cars. Everybody put cars in their stands this year because we like cars. But, but in reality, none of them are particularly innovative if you compare them to the Tesla, which actually is an extremely digital display. The displays are on the steering wheel and other places, so much more natural. So I think it kind of, like, they've proven that you can do it today. There's not, there's not a technology barrier. It's more of a probably, like, process. We're too conservative in the way that we work. OK, we have our question. Uh, uh, a recurring concept in design is mobile application design is that uh, eventually the application should disappear from the actual experience. I mean, it's like enhance the experience, but should disappear. It shouldn't be in the focus of the user. Um, I understand the idea, but how do you really get that to happen? I mean, it's like you are doing the workout, and you have a workout application. How do you make the other application disappear from the workout experience? I, I think personally that using objects that are related to the activity or more or closer to the activity itself help to disappear because you don't need, I mean, it's not like doing workout with a mobile phone, you know? It's much better to have a bracelet or whatever, you know, in your arm. So in general, how do you approach that, that problem of disappearing from the user experience? Um, let me see if I've got the question right. Your question is how you ensure that an experience feels like it's invisible. So it's... Invisible is quite a big word, right? Or disappearing is quite a big word. You're never going to take away the fact that you've got in front of you a mobile device until such point when we do, we are wearable strategy is, is um, significantly better than it is today. But to make something disappear, it's about the right use case. It's about understanding the consumer need. It's about really understanding the context that someone's in. So yes, when I'm working out, Having a phone with me is a little bit awkward, it's a little bit strange, but it's looking at how you can make that phone fit easily within someone's lifestyle. So NTC is a women's training app, and we look at how women work out and how they train and how they use a device when they're training, and they tend to happily have the device in front of them, read the instructions, they like having added information. Similarly, when a woman's in the gym, they will read the instructions and make sure they're doing it right was when we've explored a man's version of MPT, of NTC, it's a very different kettle of fish because men don't like to read the instructions. They don't want to have the device out, so the device is in their pocket. It's true, I'm sorry, you don't. Um, they like to have the device in their pocket, so we're designing around those scenarios. So for a woman, the invisibility is about giving her the feedback and the support that she needs to get it right, and for a man, the invisibility is actually by trying to make it as invisible as possible by using voice commands, by using descriptors, rather than actually having a device in front of them. They can put it in their pocket. They can just tap it to move to the next exercise. So no, we can never make it. So we can never make it completely invisible. But you're making it as seamless and integrated into their real-world experience as possible. Is there another question? The microphone is. St 
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joanna uh, from Space Engineering. Uh, you are all giving kind of consultancy services in design to very important companies. My question is, how do you position yourself against strategic consultancies such as BCG, Boston Consulting Group, McKinsey? Because in fact, what you are doing is also a kind of strategy, no? So I can start. We actually work together with them <laughs> because we think that uh, a lot of the time, if you take a company like PwC, they're normally very good at working with the CFOs. Sometimes they move a little bit more into the marketing in their high-level strategy. We're no normally a little bit further down in the organizations. For us, it's, it's great to try to find that like really top-level strategy of the company and fit that together with, um, with what we're doing, which is more the service design, the user experience design, and, and getting things done. So actually, from my perspective, it works really well together. So, partner. Wait until you get acquired, like Fjord or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, but it's a good question. I mean, once we are more into Internet of Things, but I think mobile for the last couple of years was really like, you know, one part of the CMO really down there mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the advertising department, and, and that's where it started. Now it's much more in the product, mm -hmm. right? So it's much more strategic, I think. But so I think it's a good question where you kind of compete, where uh, our strategists and Excel kind of driven people better in, in driving products or services than designers. Um, it's a combination of it, or how would you say? I mean, there, there is a challenge that, that, um, that the value that we're providing as a, as a service designer or in general is, is soft. It doesn't make it less of a value, but if you're competing for resources, those uh, hard values, which is, you know, I give you these numbers, they may be right or wrong. I mean, you know, all consultants, they pull these things out of their nose, at least when it comes to the numbers. Um, but, but it always has a heavier weight. So what we had to learn is to make, um, you know, on one hand, make an impact and prove it through that. So it's, you know, we require sometimes a leap of faith. Hey, you know, we have done this before. It really had this impact with these other ones. So, so work with us and then, then see afterwards. Um, but we also have had to really learn to speak the language. And so how, how do we translate this qualitative, let's say, you know, fuzzy, touchy-feely things, which are really important when it comes to people actually using your services. Um, so how do we translate those qualitative insights into something that is um, then manageable by those who make the decisions later on, which is typically business decisions? Right. Harold, we have to wrap up. Last, like uh, the last, last question, question right? If you can make yes. it quick. I see the uh, number blinking here. I just wanted to know what are the design strategies that you have adopted uh, to improve the experience or uh, the checkout experience for M-commerce and the conversion from just the user to uh, a successful sale for M-commerce through apps? Wow. Yeah, I think, I think you'll actually see lots of exciting things at Mobile World Congress around that. I saw uh, MasterCards, must, what was it, Pass, MasterPass, I, obviously PayPal has done a great job with it. I think actually there's lots and lots of different innovations. The challenge is that for the user, it's becoming more and more complicated because the user first has to choose which one of those that they want to use because there's not really a consistent method today. But I think it's, it's all about trialing all of these methods. And then you see, obviously, if you look at a service like Uber today in terms of how you pay for a taxi, it's almost seamless. So if you can integrate it into the app experience, then you can do it extremely well. So. All right. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, panel. <laughs> and have a great day at four years from now. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.